Right now, we're going to All-American offensive lineman Mike Johnson. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the game in T-Town. I'm doing pretty good, brother. It's uh, it's raining pretty hard on me over here in Atlanta, so I hope you guys can hear me okay. No, no, it's it's raining cr- like crazy here. It's uh, but it's it's been raining quarterbacks here in Tuscaloosa, and you know Nick. <laughs> hey, I love it. Hey, it, it is. You know what? I, two weeks ago, I told Marquise, I said, "Forget it," because you try to push the conversation, and you end up going right back to it. And so I said, forget it. We're going we're gonna to have to survive two more weeks. We're going to talk about it all the way to Louisville. Because everybody wants to know. It's, it's, you know, it's why the A-Day scrimmage on Saturday was jam-packed with former players because they want to see it too. Yeah, you know, Ryan, what I think is funny, and, and, and you'll, you know, you'll get a kick out of this too, is that I, I look at it because I'm a Bama guy and because you're a Bama guy, and you look at it and say, well, all these Alabama fans want to know the start of quarter. It's a national thing, though. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, everybody watched the national championship game. All the national sports writers. You look at Bruce Feldman, you look at Barrett Salee, you look at all these guys, Stuart Mandel, they all don't know who the starting quarterback's going to be. So I don't I don't know if it's just an Alabama fan thing or just a message board or just a game with Ryan Bell. I, I think it's a national, national conversation. And honestly, I, I think it's an ode to where Alabama football is, that the starting quarterback competition was not like this. The last couple of quarterback competitions they had, this is a national conversation, man. I have been asked about it a dozen times in the in the last week, and uh, and honestly, I'm like everybody else. I'm just waiting to see. I'm I'm, I'm buckled up and ready for that uh, that first snap against Louisville right now. I did a radio hit last week in Seattle. I kid you not. They wanted to know who they thought was going to be the quarterback. It, it just it, it's crazy that this topic of conversation, Mike. Let me ask you. You think those hundred and five players? Well, let's let's take the two out. Let's take Jalen. The 103 players left on that uh, fall camp roster. Do you think they know who it's who it is? I think they probably have a pretty good idea. And uh, you know, listen, there's a ton of storylines. I mean, the storylines read like a roadmap of the city of Atlanta right now. I mean, it's just everything intersects, everything crosses over each other. Every storyline you can think of. But I, I would say at this point that they have a pretty good idea. And you know, you notice, guys, that there's a wow factor from guys. When A.J. McCarron was a true freshman in 2009, we all knew he was going to be a starting quarterback. Well, you know, he had the wow factor. He had the ability to make plays. He had that ability to be on the same page with his receivers. He had the work ethic. I'm not saying that either one of these guys right now lack any of those things, but I, I think at this point you have a pretty good idea. Now, I think what's interesting, and that's why the conversation has carried on so long, is that both these guys do – completely different things very very well and and so you know you might have an idea of where the offense wants to go but maybe the offense coordinator has a different direction in where the offense wants to go or maybe you know somebody has a higher risk of one thing and a lower risk of something else but I think for the most part a lot of the players involved in the team right now probably have a pretty good idea of who they think the better quarterback is now with some of the storylines that are coming out and some of the other things that are involved in this decision I don't know that you know, I, I don't know if they'll be 100% correct, but I would say most guys on the roster right now have a pretty good idea in their mind who they think is going to be the starting quarterback, uh, you know, come September 1st. Okay, if, if you think, judging what you know about Nick Saban, do you think it's going to be inside that building that they're going to continue to split these reps? Or at what point does it become a disadvantage when you know who your guy is going to be, but you need to really get him more first-string reps and build – some of that chemistry, or do you think this thing's going to walk all the way down to Louisville and none of us are going to know absolutely nothing? I think that there will be meaningful snaps in which quarterback gets which snaps, if that makes sense. Now, you know, like if Jalen is going to be the backup quarterback, I think they'll give Jalen a ton of team reps. I think they'll give Jalen some seven-on-seven reps. I think when it comes down to two-minute drill, when it comes down to red ball, when it comes down to some of the goal line and red zone packages, if two is going to be the starter, then I think two gets those more meaningful snaps, the more game-ready snaps, the more situational snaps, and vice versa. I mean, if Jalen's going to be the starter, I think he'll get situational snaps built into to his kind of rep count this week. I don't think it'll be skewed too heavily in one direction or the other. I mean, listen, you, we saw the USC game a couple of years ago. All of a sudden, you know, two quarters into the game, you've run through three quarterbacks. Blake Barnett might have got all the snaps, but he wasn't the one who came out on the end of it. So I don't think it'll skew too heavily. But I definitely think, listen, I know Nick Saban's detail-oriented. I think that he's sitting there looking at those practice schedules going, okay, I want this guy in this period and this guy in this period. And that way we get a, look, a good look at, at which guy is going to be the starter and which is not. And they're ready for those situations come game time. 
Mike, as a analyst, and I love to hear your analysis on so many different things, I think the way that you see the game is, is always we find fascinating. How concerned are you with the depth on the defensive side of the football? You lose Vandarius Calvin to discipline. You lose Terrell Lewis with a knee injury. Now you lose another guy in Chris Allen going down with another knee injury. He's going to be lost for the season. How concerned are you with this depth on the defensive side of the football? Well, I think that as you move through the season, it becomes more and more concerning. Um, you know, I think obviously you want to be able to get pressure and some of these long passing downs that you'll probably face against Louisville. I don't, I honestly, Ryan, I don't know that it rears, it rears its head against Louisville. I really don't. I mean, I think, you know, you're looking at obviously a four touchdown favorite in Alabama. And you're looking at a pretty pass heavy team. I think when you get in some of these run situations, some of these teams really want to be bruisers. The LSU's of the world, you know, teams like that are really going to come at you. I think that's when it, it becomes more concerning because then I think, you know, you put the freshmen in there and you put some of the light, you know, the guys that are lighter in the butt, and then all of a sudden those guys are getting rolled up. And then all of a sudden there's nicks and dings all across the front. So, you know, I I think it's concerning, extremely concerning. But I think we have a few more weeks left, maybe a month left, before it really becomes a huge concern for me. I think you can plug in, you know, Cameron too. I think you can, you know, plug in some of these other guys um, that can get meaningful snaps at the linebacker position. But when the bruising college football teams come to town, maybe even starting with Ole Miss, even though they're not a bruising team, they got a big offensive line. When those teams start to come to town, that's when I think it becomes a bigger issue. And I, I listen, we've got the best coaching staff in America. I know you say it, I say it all the time. Give them another month and let's see what we have at this linebacker position. But until then, I think it's going to be worrisome. I think Nick Saban said it best the other day. It's not like we just come up with more and more players. We're going to have to coach these guys into shape, allow these guys to get reps. It'll come with repetition, but, uh, you know, it's something that most people aren't going to know. Only the people inside that locker room are going to know how ready they are with the depth concerns. Um, but, you know, I, I'm like every other Alabama fan out there. I always err on the side of caution and saying, hey, we have a really, really good coaching staff, and, and we have pretty good players out there. So let's see what happens here in the next few weeks. And uh, hopefully they're doing pretty good by the time you get into that SEC schedule. So, Mike, does that put more pressure on the offense to knock these teams out, put points on the board, and allow some of those – uh, backups to get more quality reps in, a, in, a, in significant times of games? Well, it's it, it's an interesting conversation. I think it could go either way. I mean, I've been of that mind all offseason to where, hey, we got six new starters, five new starters in the secondary going against a Louisville pass-happy offense. Hey, let's keep the offense on the field as long as we can, or do you want to score points at a fast pace? Um, I think we've got the offensive line to really take the game over, have 12, 14, 16 play drives and get in the end zone. But I don't know that they'll take that, you know, take that route. I, you know, listen, if two talking about Valo starting a quarterback, I think you're taking your shots down the field and seeing what you can put up. I, I think it's going to be extremely interesting game plan from Mike Loxley and Danny Eno's perspective of how fast they want to snap the ball, how fast they're doing no huddle, just how often they're airing it out, or are they grounded pound saying, hey, you know what, Louisville's defense can't stop our run game. Let's keep this on the ground. Let's get let Jalen get some snaps at quarterback. Let's run some of these option plays. Let's make sure we're staying on the field because we don't want to expose our defense to something like that. So, I, you know, I, I wish I knew. I, I think it's going to be extremely intriguing once you see these guys take the field. I'm going to be locked into every snap. I want to know if it's going to be no huddle spread, if they're going to have four wide receivers on the first snap, or are we going to see, you know, two tight ends? Are we going to see Irv Smith and, uh, you know, some of these other tight ends out there, Kedrick James possibly come in and, and, and be in two tight ends and kind of dink and dunk like that. I'm really looking forward to seeing what these guys roll out of that game plan. Mike, one of the things that's really appealing when you look at all these talented offensive linemen, I mean, there's going to be five stars that are not going to get playing time on this offensive line. I'm going to read you what has been the, the pretty much the starting five so far. Jonah Williams at left, Lester Cotton at left guard, Ross Pierce Baker at center, Alex Leatherwood bumped inside a little bit at right guard, and then Jedrick Wills at, at right tackle. I'm curious what you think about that five. Well, I think obviously the most intriguing thing is that you are you have a lot of guys that played a lot of snaps last year, but almost none of them in, you know, in similar positions to what they were. I mean, Lester Cotton split inside, Alex Leatherwood all of a sudden's at guard. I'd be intrigued to see what really the decision-making process was behind Alex Leatherwood moving to guard and Jedrick Wills moving back out to tackle, kind of flip-flopping. Because I thought Jedrick Wills, from what I've seen, you, you've noticed this, a lot of Alabama fans noticed this last year, and their jumbo packages, he was brought in at tackle, and Matt Womack was asked to flip, and these guys on the front side, Jedrick Wills and, uh, and Lester Cotton, were asked to be road-grading, run-blocking guys on the right side of that offensive line and that heavy package with Keenan Williams in the backfield. So I think it's intriguing all of a sudden to where 
I thought this guy was perfectly suited to be guard, and I think Jedrick Will is a good tackle, but I thought he was perfectly suited to be guard. Now he's kicking back out to tackle, and a guy that seems to be an incredibly you know, talented tackle is bumping into guard. I'd be intrigued to know what the, the thought process behind that was. Maybe Alex Leatherwood is struggling a little bit more than they wanted him to in some of the running game stuff. Maybe he's having a hard time adjusting to the right side of the offensive line. But I don't think there's any way you slice it. You and I have talked about it all offseason. Extremely talented. And I'm extremely excited to see where these guys go because I think once the starting five get locked in, the ability to really you know work next to each other and do those things throughout those game week practices, I think makes them ten times better. I just hope those guys get locked in. It was this time a year ago, or two years ago, I'm sorry, Ryan, that we saw Rosh Piercebaker flip from center back to left guard. I'll be intrigued to see if there's any last-minute deals like that. Like, if any of these guys get switched around here this coming week in, in preparation of Louisville, or if they go ahead with these five. But I'm not worried about it at all. I, I don't think there's a bad decision to make with those uh, those five guys up front. It's just a matter of getting them in the right spot. Mike, I've asked you this several times, but people, you know, as football season gets everybody re-engaged, our, our phones, our Twitter, they, they want me to ask you, uh, does it really determine left-handed guy, right-handed guy at that right tackle spot? I mean, do you look at that and say, you better be at least a quality right tackle to protect that blind side? I think you do. And and I don't think it has near as much effect now, especially in this offense as it used to. And and listen, Ryan, I've gone on the record with you plenty of times. I think Jonah Williams is a better right tackle from what I've seen the last two years. I think he was a better right tackle than he was a left tackle. And obviously, Alex Leatherwood must be a better left tackle than he is a right tackle because he's been pushed to guard. So I think if it was a huge thing on their mind, I, I think if Brent Key was really concerned about it or Dan Enos or Michael Loxley, you'd see a flip back. I think you'd see uh, you know, a Leatherwood at left and a Jonah Williams at right. But I don't think that it really has a lot to do with what's going on right now. I really think that they're treating it as a true quarterback competition right now. They don't want to make a permanent switch with the tackles. And honestly, in this day and age in these offenses where everything is a you know an RPO or a read option or some of these guys are rolling out, getting in the flat, it just doesn't have as much to do with it as it used to. I mean, there, there's just not a lot of times, unless you're in two-minute drill, where you're going to have a guy getting hit off the blind side. And so I think that uh, whether it's two or Jalen in there, both those guys would be very aware of their surroundings. You know, maybe you get into the season and maybe you have two as a full-time starter and you, you, know, you think about making a flip like that. But I think they feel confident enough at Jedrick Wills at right tackle. I think he's good enough at right tackle to where he can be a blind side tackle. So with all the, guy, with all the tackle prospects they have and, 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 and all those guys they have up front, I think they feel comfortable no matter what the combination is right now. So I don't think you'll see any kind of last-minute preparations in that direction. Hey, we cannot. And we're also, you know, we're judging. I mean, listen, if we walked out there and there was somebody at right tackle that's, uh, you know, that would be a hint in the quarterback situation. So maybe Nick Saban's doing this all behind closed doors. You never know what the master is up to here in Tuscaloosa. I, I, listen, hey, I don't think there's any doubt about that, that Nick Saban has thought about that. I, I will guarantee you right now that Nick Saban has thought about that and what that would look like if they made that switch. I guarantee it's gone sure. through his mind. Oh, so, there's, uh, he, he leaves Noah Stone on over, on turn, overturned. Yep, so. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I guarantee you it's gone through his mind. So it, 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 it's intriguing to say the least. I pay a lot of attention to those tackle positions. And after seeing Leatherwood at left tackle in that national championship game, Ryan, I really did think, you know what, this guy might be the future left tackle of the team. And all of a sudden, he's at right guard. I, I, I would, I would love to be inside of Brent Key's head and know just exactly what into that decision. But I really, I trust those guys that they've got them all in the right spots right now. Mike Johnson, I appreciate you for being a part of the show, and I hope you have an amazing week. Thank you, sir. Always fun, Ryan. Hey, we're getting close, everybody. Twelve days away. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Mike.